Hello, and welcome to the AWS Research Seminar Series. I'm Jack Fenwick, Strategic Alliances Manager for the Higher Education Research Team at AWS, and I will be your moderator for today. I am pleased to be joined today by Chris Kirsten from NVIDIA, as well as Umair Khalid and Dr. Steve Fu from AWS to discuss NVIDIA Flare on AWS, enabling privacy-preserving medical research using federated learning techniques. Chris is a technical marketing engineer at NVIDIA focused on artificial intelligence and distributed computing. He works on scaling machine and deep learning solutions to solve pressing problems in healthcare. Umair is a solutions architect at AWS focused on healthcare and life science product development in the AWS industry product group. He is passionate about building frictionless experiences to simplify healthcare delivery. And last, but certainly not least, Dr. Steve Fu is a senior solutions architect at AWS. He earned his PhD uh, in pharmaceutical science from the University of Mississippi and held a postdoctoral fellowship with the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Fu has more than 10 years of technology and biomedical research experience and is passionate about the impact cloud-based technology can have on the healthcare industry. Um, Thank you uh, all for joining and talking to us today about NVIDIA Flare, and I will now hand it over to Chris. Chris, the floor is yours. Jack, thanks for the intro and thanks for kicking us off today. Um, so just to cover briefly the agenda, I'll cover an intro to federated learning using NVIDIA Flare. Um, I'll hand it off to Umer, who will discuss some of the tools on AWS that can be used um, to deploy NVIDIA Flare on the AWS platform. And then we'll close with a demo um, showing federated learning using Moni and NVIDIA Flare. So for an intro to the platform, I'm gonna give a brief overview of federated learning at a high level and cover um, some of the technical details of our implementation for federated learning, highlight some of the workflows that we've bundled with the platform, and highlight a few of the new features in Flare version 2.2 that help developers and data scientists move from, um, from prototypes and development to real world deployment, and I'll also include a few resources that you can use to get started. Going into a little bit more detail, we'll talk about the high-level FL architecture, some of the tools, services, and deployments that allow you to move from, from POC to production. We'll talk a little bit about the Flare application structure and the simulator that developers can use to get started. And we'll also highlight some of the tools that we use to move from POC to secure distributed deployments and the way these can be used on AWS. So in general, building robust generalizable models is difficult. And this is due to a couple factors. Uh, one is the issue of data diversity. Um, in the cases of uh, situations where you're trying to build models to predict uh, rare diseases, uh, data scarcity is a big concern. And building out diverse data sets requires pulling in um, data sets from different institutions. And when you have this need of pulling in and building out large data sets, um, data privacy is a concern, especially in healthcare where we have concerns for patient privacy and data governance. So how do we improve this robustness? One option that has emerged is federated learning where we can address this question of data diversity by building out data sets across different sites and, and enabling training without sharing any data among those sites. In this scenario, we build out models that are trained locally on individual sites uh, and validated on local data uh, with a central server used to aggregate the results of training on independent sites without sharing data to build a global model. If we look a little bit more in depth at how this takes place, we could have uh, a number of participants who all sit on their own data sets, private data that can't be shared, um, but who can build a local model using compute resources um, and implement privacy preserving algorithms. Um, the results of this training is aggregated um, by a central server to build a global model. And this is often done in the case of deep learning by 
um, aggregating uh, deltas to the model weights, for example, to build out a federated model. So NVIDIA has built an open source SDK that enables this federated learning platform. Um, this has been open sourced under the Apache 2.0 license and enables distributed multi-party collaborative learning. And we like to point out that, you know, this isn't just for deep learning, but we've built uh, a set of, of domain and framework agnostic tools that allow you to build workflows across different platforms like PyTorch, NumPy, TensorFlow, or Monai. Uh, we also have a set of uh, algorithms that allow you to adapt existing standalone machine learning and deep learning frameworks to a federated paradigm. This includes tools for uh, building your, your federated learning workflows, as well as tools for managing a federation through provisioning and orchestration and monitoring. Alongside these tools, we offer algorithms that enable privacy preservation through things like homomorphic encryption and differential privacy. And we'll get into a little bit more detail about how these plug in to the Flare architecture. All of this is API driven, written in specification based APIs so that these workflows can be customized to your needs. So this picture gives a high level view of the Flare stack. At the base, we've implemented uh, what we call the Federated Learning Application Runtime Environment or Flare platform. This includes all the tools for communication, establishing identity and security and privacy among the participants in a federation. And on top of this, we have a set of commonly used APIs that enable federated learning workflows, like workflow controllers for the server and client executor APIs that can be used to implement your training tasks. On top of this, we pr provide reference implementation of different federation workflows like scatter and gather or cyclic weight transfer, as well as tools for global model evaluation and cross-site evaluation. We've also added tools that enable federated data science through things like XGBoost or distributed analytics. On top of that, we have a set of learning algorithms that are coming out of federated learning research. This started with uh, a simple federated average workflow and we've built on top of that to include things like federated optimization, uh, federated proxy loss where you can impose loss on uh, client training results to pre prevent drift from a global model. Um, on the left-hand side, you see the FL simulator. This is a tool that's used to allow developers in data science to develop locally uh, federated models without the overhead of provisioning a secure distributed deployment. And on the right hand side, we provide the set of tools that you'll see today that can be used on platforms like AWS to provision a secure distributed deployment. Looking at the high level architecture, um, the, the key takeaway from this side is that all of these components are customizable and pluggable. Um, all of this is API driven and can be customized to meet your needs. On the top right, you can see the standard hub and spoke model of federated learning where you have a central server connected to a set of clients. These are the entities that, that execute a federated learning workflow with clients um, performing local training on local data without sharing data and the server aggregating the results of that training to build a global model. You also see an admin tool that can be used um, to orchestrate the federated learning experiment, to submit jobs, to manage the state of the participants, and to, to perform the, the overall federated learning workflow. On the left is just a, a, a high level picture of the, the system architecture. Um, in this case, we have the ability to run um, multiple jobs on the server and client and use resource management to determine how those jobs are executed. And then on the bottom left, we also have a picture of our hot cold architecture for high availability where you can have an overseer managing the state of the service providers or servers in the federation so that in the event of a server failure, you can fail over to backup servers to avoid losing uh, the, the state and the progress of your federated learning experiment. This shows a high level picture of the deployment architecture. And Steve will show what this looks like in his demo on AWS. At a high level, we have tools for project administration. This is used for provisioning, um, either using the Flare dashboard or our built-in provisioning tool. This provisioning tool is used to generate startup kits, which are shown here, 
for each of the participants in the Federation. These startup kits are used to establish the identity of each participant, including certificates for um, secure authentication between clients and servers. Um, these are used also to establish um, the client and server processes that, that employ secure communication to execute federated learning workflows. I'd like to point out a couple of the entities here. Um, we have the Flare server and clients that we saw on the previous slide in the hub and spoke model. Um, we also have admin consoles um, for both users and org administrators, as well as the project administrators. This is a console that allows you to manage the state of the experiment and check the status of all the participants in the Federation. This is a picture of the high level workflow that's executed by the server and the clients. On the right hand side, you see the federated learning server, which runs a controller workflow that governs the set of tasks that are assigned to the clients. On the client side, you have a worker that implements an executor that's capable of executing these name based tasks that are assigned by the server. The client side worker could implement um, any number of tasks and the server will assign these tasks by name and when the client is triggered to execute a task, it will perform uh, a workflow, for example, deep learning training or machine learning training and then submit the results of that task back to the server controller. The controller workflow will then aggregate that data, for example, using a Fed average. On the outbound assigned task leg and the inbound submit task result leg, uh, you can see that there's filters on the task data and the task result. This is where we can plug in our tools for privacy preservation, like differential privacy and homomorphic encryption. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that is implemented um, by the clients in the Federation on the next few slides. This is a picture of our high-level authorization framework. On the left-hand side, you see central authorization that's governed by the federated learning server. This is often imposed by the project admin and can define a set of global defaults that are used to govern um, the different roles and rights of the clients that are participating in the federation. For example, who is allowed to view the status of different organizations' clients, to check logs, uh, to see the progress of individual clients' training, this is also used to govern who can assign tasks to the various clients. Um, typically, this is, this is defined at the outside of the federated learning project. Um, and on the right-hand side, you see a new federated authorization framework that's new in Flare version 2.2. Um, this pushes that authorization mechanism out to individual clients, where clients are free to define their own authorization policies and govern who can access their systems or run code on an individual client or view logs. This gives uh, clients um, fine-grained control over client site privacy. Looking at this in a little more detail with respect to the controller worker uh, workflow, this also gives clients the ability to define their own privacy filters that, it, that govern the data exchange between the server and clients. Um, it's often the case that Different client sites have different data privacy needs, and this allows each client to define their own filters that will govern um, what is exchanged between the client and the server. The way this is implemented is a distributed site policy management. You can see on the right um, just a, a mock-up of what we ship in the startup kits that we showed on a previous slide. The startup kits include for example, client configuration and a set of scripts that are used to run the client, as well as a set of local authorization, log, privacy, and resource configurations. When a project is first started, uh, the project admin will define a set of defaults for these configurations, and these can be overridden by each client that's participating. These include uh, authorization policies, who can touch um, that client, and, and who can determine the tasks and code that are executed by that client. Um, we also have controls for logging. It's often the case in DL and ML training that, um, that potentially private information could be exposed in the training logs. Um, this can be set so that none of that information is exposed to any outside participants. 
and then the privacy policies that govern the filters that are applied to the data that's exchanged between clients and servers, as well as what resources that can be used on that client system. For example, if you have multiple GPUs on a client and only want to use one for training, um, that can be limited in your resource utilization config uh, per client. Just at a high level, some of these tools uh, that are used to get started, um, most of these are bundled under our NVIDIA Flare uh, CLI, the NV Flare CLI, and these include uh, tools for research like the simulator and the POC mode, um, tools for previewing authorization policies for your client configurations, and then the set of tools that help you deploy for production. So this includes the Flare provisioner, um, the dashboard, and then a set of tools that can be used on the client systems to run pre-flight checks to make sure that you can establish connectivity between the federated clients and the server. And as you'll see with what uh, Umer and Steve present a little bit later, um, we're working on end-to-end -end deployment scripts uh, that simplify deploying to, uh, to the cloud. I'm going to touch briefly now on the overall federated learning workflow and some of the tools that can be used to do federated data science and deep learning. Um, at a high level, with version 2.2, we focused on the end-to-end -end workflow. So moving from a developer or data scientist doing uh, rapid development on a local workstation, for example, um, to the set of tools that are required for a streamlined deployment and operation of uh, real distributed secure federated learning workflow. So to start, I'm just gonna briefly introduce the simulator. Uh, this is a tool that can be run locally on any laptop or workstation by a developer to test a NVIDIA Flare application. So this includes um, the ability to run any number of connected server and clients um, with or without GPUs. This gives you flexibility to specify um, the number of clients and the number of threads on which to run. So for example, on a system with a, a limited set of resources, you have the ability to run uh, a federated learning workflow serially and perform the aggregation over many rounds to test scalability of your federated application. Um, a couple key benefits of this simulator are one, the fact that it's API driven. Um, you can run this simulator in a debugger like VS Code or PyCharm and, and insert breakpoints in your Flare application um, to debug and, and develop. But this same application structure, which we'll get into on the next few slides, is entirely portable between the simulator and a real world um, distributed deployment. So once you've developed your application locally, you just pick up this application structure and drop it on the distributed deployment and you're ready to go and run securely. So this application structure is defined as a directory tree. And the config uh, for the client and server define this controller and executor workflow. And then a custom code directory that defines uh, the executor workflow. So this is the code that's executed on the client trainers. Um, this is showing an example of our Hello PyTorch, uh, just a simple Hello World that trains on CIPAR 10. Um, and implements TensorBoard streaming to show the results of training. Um, Steve will show a, a more advanced version of this that's implemented on with our Mon IFL integration in the demo. Looking at, a little bit more closely at how this comes together, so the server config defines this scatter and gather workflow. So if we think back to the stack that we showed initially, this is using the built-ins, for example, the scatter and gather or hub and spoke algorithm and defining the number of clients that will participate, the number of rounds of training that will be executed, and then some of the other components that are used um, to aggregate the results of the di distributed training or to save the models uh, locally for cross-site model evaluation. On the client side, the tasks that are defined as part of this controller workflow um, are implemented in an executor, um, in this case, we have uh, a set of tasks that will do training, um, we'll submit the model for validation, and we'll run cross-site validation. So this uses our built-in learner executor, which includes routines um, that can be extended to, to do the commonly used uh, pieces of the, the DL workflow, 
like local training and validation as well as cross-site validation. Um, this shows the components of that workflow where you've implemented um, the training validation and cross-site validation as well as the TensorBoard streaming analytics as part of a local uh, PT learner. Um, this is what's implemented in custom code. So you can extend these built-ins uh, to train any model. In this case, um, we have a set of constants that are defined for saving the model and running cross-site validation, as well as a simple CNN that's used by this learner for training. In addition to some of these uh, common DL workflows in PyTorch or TensorFlow, uh, we also have uh, tools for doing federated data science. Uh, the first one is federated statistics. As you build out a federated learning um, experiment, there's often the need to do data discovery. Um, so we've built a controller and executor that allow you to do um, simple statistics like calculating um, sum and mean and counts across data sets. This runs statistics locally on each client and shares uh, the results of those um, back to the server without sharing data to aggregate a set of global statistics. Um, we also have tools for calculating image histograms. This is useful, uh, for example, in Monai FL, which allows you to do statistical analysis across a set of images that are used for um, training on medical images. We've also implemented XGBoost. Uh, there's been a lot of requests for uh, federated data science in addition to federated deep learning. Um, and this is based on the community DMLC implementation of distributed XGBoost. And we've provided um, a couple different implementations built into the platform that allow you to run um, distributed data science workflows. So moving ahead to introduce um, Monai. Uh, Monai is uh, the medical open network for AI. It's an extension or built on PyTorch and includes a set of tools that allow you to construct end-to-end -end medical imaging workflows. This could be in radiology, pathology, endoscopy. Um, it's, a, it's a suite of different platforms that allow you to build out tools for labeling and annotating data sets, um, for running the core training using things like self-supervised learning and auto 3D. Um, and now with uh, version 1.0 to run federated learning. Monai also includes tools for deployment. So once you've trained a model, you can package uh, a Monai training workflow and model definition in a way that can be easily deployed on um, clinic or hospital endpoints to, to do inference. Um, there's also the idea of a model zoo where the community is building models on this platform and sharing these models as a starting point. And all of these can plug into uh, NVIDIA Flare through the Monai FL, which we'll look at briefly here. So as part of version 1.0 in Monai, Monai provided a, a, a couple of APIs that allow you to plug in any federated learning workflow. Um, so these are, are generic APIs that allow you um, to extend client algorithms for training as well as to tie into the Monai algorithms. For example, the Monai bundle that allows you to define the training workflows. These training workflows can then be seamlessly um, extended to a federated paradigm using these client algorithm executors. Um, NVIDIA Flare is, is the first platform that's implemented these uh, the Monai client algorithm executors, and Steve will show this in his demo. This all works on the Monai bundle, um, which is the, the Monai structure that defines um, the overall training workflow, as well as any transforms that are used um, to prepare the input data sets and tools for validation and inference. So moving ahead, I'm gonna look in a little more detail at the tools that are used to go beyond this kind of development environment and the FL simulator. So these are the tools for deployment and operations that Steve will show in the demo today. Um, there's a suite of tools that allow you to move kind of step by step from the simulation to a, a real secure um, distributed deployment. So there's a POC mode that allows you to test uh, moving from a, a simulated uh, federated learning run to a discrete set of connected server and clients. 
Um, you can then provision securely using the NVFlare provisioner to develop um, a set of uh, um, containers that can be used to test a distributed deployment locally, as well as to set up the identity of the clients and server that will be deployed across a distributed uh, set of resources like AWS. We also provide a, a dashboard UI that gives a project administrator the ability to define an FL experiment or project and allow clients to join that project and register to participate. Looking a little more closely at the provisioner, this is an example of a project configuration where on the right hand side, we see the set of participants. This includes an overseer for high availability, um, a set of servers and a set of clients. This provisioner is driven by a set of builder modules that are used to build the, the overall workspace for federated learning. So this includes configurations at each of the sites who are participating, um, as well as templates for scripts that are used to launch the server and clients um, and certificates and signatures that are used to establish um, the identities of, of all the participants. Um, as you'll see in the demo, um, for establishing the server identity, um, we typically like to use a fully qualified domain name so that the clients and servers are able to, to access the server. Um, but that's not required. You can also define um, if you're using like local training on, on a network without DNS, you can use host name and Etsy host entries to establish the connectivity. And then new in 2.2 is the ability to run dynamic provisioning. So if you've established a project and have decided that you would like to extend this to a larger set of clients, um, you can easily add additional clients and continue on with a federated learning project without starting from scratch. Um, this is just a quick picture of the project admin dashboard. This is a new tool with version 2.2 that allows a project admin to define the overall scope of the study and publish a web UI um, that can then be distributed to users, allowing them to register, define their organization configuration, as well as sites within that organization. This gives the admin the ability to approve or deny participation by those sites. And once the project is finalized with participants, uh, this interface can be used to distribute all the console packages and training client packages to the organizations and sites who are participating. Um, just to touch a little bit more on security, which you'll see in uh, Steve's deployment, um, which is a, a secure distributed deployment. Um, there's you know, pieces of the security picture which uh, Flare can address and, and elements which are outside of, of the, the federated learning security picture, which tools like AWS can be used to address. Um, so like we covered on a previous slide, um, the aspects of federated learning that Flare touches are things like identity security, communication security, uh, data privacy, and the ability to audit um, the progress of training. But outside the scope are things like physical security, firewall policies, and data management policies. And AWS provides a great set of tools that can be used to address some of these other security concerns. Um, okay, we're about halfway through. I'm just going to briefly highlight a few of these resources and then turn it over to Umer um, to introduce uh, the AWS tools that can be used to enable this kind of deployment. Um, so just to, to recap, um, some of the key capabilities of the platform are these built-in privacy preserving algorithms, training and evaluation workflows, uh, management tools, and support for common frameworks through examples. And all of these are implemented on the Flare API, which allows you to take the reference implementation of these privacy preserving algorithms and training workflows and extend them to meet your needs. Um, to recap what's new in 2.2, we have the new simulator, um, the ability to run uh, distributed federated uh, statistical analysis and um, machine learning workflows like XGBoost, and then the tools for um, secure distributed deployments, the Flare dashboard, the unified CLI for managing the study, and uh, client controlled privacy policies. 
Um, this is just highlighting some of the work we've done to test uh, these privacy preser preserving algorithms. I would encourage you to review this. We've got some blogs as well as some papers that, that cover the evaluation of these privacy preserving algorithms and how they perform, as well as examples that walk through this on the GitHub. Uh, one of these is the CIFAR 10 example. This compares uh, multiple federated learning workflows with and without the security policies in place and assesses the performance of the models, comparing all of these to a centrally trained model. And a set of links to help you get started. And with that, I will hand off to Umer to discuss uh, the AWS tools that enable this kind of a workflow. Awesome. Um, thank you, Chris, for that fantastic deep dive into Flare. Um, hi, everyone. This is Umer from AWS. And today, I will be discussing how Flare can be deployed on the AWS platform. So as we know, uh, federal learning typically necessitates a server environment and number of clients. Chris, if you can potentially move to the next slide. Oh, there we go. Thanks. Um, so let, let's look at let's look at this diagram. Um, you can see that it depicts many of the building blocks found in a client and server context. Chris covered a lot of those in his presentation. Uh, so just I'm going to dive a little bit deep into these uh, from an AWS context standpoint, kind of connect the dots on how these can be deployed on the AWS cloud. So starting with the left, you'll notice the Flare clients. The Flare clients receive instructions from the server. That's primarily uh, one of the one of the mechanisms for them to communicate. And then Chris mentioned the clients will have a set of privacy preserving algorithms, a local data set which is usually contained in an Amazon S3 bucket. And this is a key uh, distinction when it comes to cloud that you can store a lot of data, uh, training data on, uh, on S3. Uh, and client is where all the local model training happens. gRPC message listeners are used to communicate with server instances. And now moving to the right-hand side of the diagram, you can see the, the Flare server. And the Flare server manages client orchestration and states so there could be a number of clients that are connected to a single server and the Flare server will be responsible for managing uh, the orchestration of those. The server also provides privacy preserving algorithms and gRPC message broker for communicating with the client instances. So next I want to cover the potential obstacles that can be that you might run into as you start your cloud deployment journey with NVIDIA Flare. And these are some th things that are potentially um, best practices that you should consider uh, for any cloud deployment. So as you can see in the diagram, a typical federal learning environment will have a number of clients. They could be distributed in different regions of AWS. Uh, as you can see, in uh, you know, you were using US East 1. Um, US West 2 here, uh, there could be also client instances which are on-premise or in other clouds as well. So the way we uh, want to make sure that the federal learning is happening in a very efficient manner is to use uh, infrastructure as code when, we come, when, when it comes to deploying the client instances. This really helps you scale in a repeatable and efficient manner the, the client deployments. And we're gonna, Steve is gonna show you in the demo how um, this this works. And of course, we, we have published some content here um, on the automated, automated uh, infrastructure automation uh, scripts. On the model development side, we recommend you use DevOps pipeline when, for, for each client using the Flare SDK. Uh, having a realistic configuration of the compute, networking, storage is important as you scale your model development and new as, and as new clients join the federation. So very critical for you to have that uh, considered. And in the real world, not all clients running a single cloud platform, like I mentioned earlier. So you will need to kind of make sure that you take into, into account the limitations of on-plan deployments along with potentially enabling cross-cloud integrations. And lastly, you want to make sure that you have adequate debugging, logging, and metric collection. This is 
basically table stakes for any cloud deployment. Uh, you, you would want to make sure that uh, any troubleshooting that you need to do, you have the right set of tools available, uh, especially in a, such a distributor system. Um, these come in really handy when you're looking to make sure things are working properly. So next, I want to look at um, how we can architect Flare on AWS and what are, if we kind of break it into, into these different buckets. Um, so we have networking, compute, storage, security identity, and management and governance. And these are some of the building blocks of AWS uh, as you will be familiar with, but of course I wanna provide some additional context when it comes to how Flare will be deployed on these. Networking is a, is a major component here. Um, you know, we have to architect for hybrid environments a lot of times, so not everything might be, not all the clients could be running on AWS. Uh, they could be running on Prama, like I mentioned, or they could be in running in a different cloud uh, platform as well. So um, in order for us to enable um, seamless communication, uh, AWS offers services like AWS Transit Gateway that come in, come in handy. Um, also, you would want to make sure that there's some data and network isolation happening. And that is usually uh, done using AWS Virtual Private Cloud uh, VPCs, uh, which will allow you to segregate resources. Um, additionally, on the, on, the, on, the, on the compute layer, of course, you would want to make sure that you select the right set of instances. We have you know, GPU instances. We also have instances which are um, uh, more general purpose. And in terms of the server, uh, the server can most likely perfectly run on the um, a, a general purpose instance. But of course, when it comes to the training instances on the on the client side, we recommend that you use GPU accelerated instances. Um, and additionally, we have a number of AMIs, uh, Amazon Machine Images, uh, that have been published, uh, one from NVIDIA, and you can basically leverage that as part of your uh, client deployment. So co coming to the story side, uh, we, of course, what, we'll have a lot of data, set, private data, right? That's one of the things that you will be using to train your models. And uh, Amazon S3 is a service that can allow you to um, basically uh, store a lot of this data and um, you know use it for training right and connect the flare environment for for training so uh, that's that's a that's a that's a handy feature and of course um, Nvidia flare will have some uh, provisioning and configuration as well and which can be stored on s3 and um, uh, Chris mentioned of course the there, there's there's a large set of security um, aspect of Flare, you want to make sure things are, uh, the data is not being shared across the different tenants uh, or different clients as well. Uh, you know, in order for you to have true privacy preserving, uh, Amazon AWS offers security groups and network, uh, network and firewall uh, isolation, which allows you to make sure the traffic doesn't flow in, in another VPC or another client environment. And I, I covered this in the, in the previous section, of course, the, you know, we have a lot of automation tools as well on AWS, like CDK, um, CloudFormation that you can use to uh, deploy automated client instances. And of course, as new clients potentially join the federation, you should be able to automate a lot of that uh, as well using the same set of tools. And uh, that one last thing I want to cover is the logging aspect. We, of course, uh, have a robust set of tools on AWS that you can leverage, such as CloudWatch, uh, CloudWatch logs that basically capture a lot of these logs. All right, so just the next thing I want to uh, finally, I want to just kind of put all these concepts in play and, and we'll jump into the demo after this. Um, basically, this here is a, uh, a, a illustrative hybrid federal learning environment using NVIDIA Flare on AWS. Uh, when I say hybrid, of course, is means that we have an on-prem data center on top, which is you know not using AWS, but we have it part of the federation. Uh, we see these three institutions working together on model development. Uh, on-premise client, of course, the medical research facility in the middle, and a cancer research center at the bottom. The medical research uh, medical research center is is also hosting the Flare server environment within their AWS account. 
but in a separate VPC. As you can see, there are two VPCs listed there. There's a server VPC and there's a medical research center VPC, which is where the client is and the model training is happening. The, the VPC segregation uh, uh, is really critical here when, it, when you are hosting a, a server and a client uh, because it will help AWS resources to be isolated from one another. Um, and of course, create that network boundary. Also, I wanna just call out a couple of things here. Um, uh, one key component uh, is the AWS Transit Gateway. Um, the AWS Transit Gateway connects your Amazon Virtual Private Clouds, VPCs, and on-prem networks through a central hub. And you can kind of see that in the center of the diagram there where um, the Amazon AWS Transit Gateway is, is, is uh, receiving traffic from the different VPCs. This connection simplifies your network and put, uh, uh, puts in an end context peering relationship. The transit gateway acts as a highly scalable cloud router, essentially, each with new connection is made once, and the gRPC traffic flows through this AWS transit gateway. And the second thing, of course, uh, I wanted to cover on this um, call out is uh, the NVIDIA Flare clients running on AWS are using the NVIDIA GPU instances offered on the EC2 platform. Uh, so P4D, um, uh, there are a number of NVIDIA GPU accelerated instances that you can leverage to accelerate model training. And each of these, um, it, of course, uh, on, the, on the client side, you can see there's an S3 bucket, which is uh, containing your private Diacom data in that case, or it could be any, any sensitive data that you would not want to be shared with the other members of the Federation uh, that of course can be uh, connected to the client instances uh, you, you, you know, within, within the VPC. All right, so um, let's move towards the, the demo. I just wanna kind of, uh, we've been kind of talking about uh, how all this comes together. Um, so what Steve is gonna show you in a, in a demo of course is is the deployment of how a federated learning environment can be set up on AWS using some of the automation scripts uh, that that I was referring to earlier. Um, and then also um, Steve is gonna discuss the, uh, uh, an example here using the Monai bundle, which is a open source library that Chris mentioned earlier, um, and enabling uh, how medical image AI research can be enabled using Flare um, in a, in a federated learning paradigm. So with that, I'll hand it off to Steve for a quick demo of this. Thank you, Umir. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Yep. Yep. Great. Thank you for the confirmation. I'm showing uh, a use case using our uh, build, uh, the workshop we have already built and published. Uh, this content is available online. Uh, you will have find the link later on uh, in the final deck slide. Um, uh, through this workshop, we will walk you through how to deploy the infrastructure, right? Like Umir mentioned, all the AWS resources um, and the, enable you to run Flare on AWS. So there are a couple of deployment options. We will go through the simple one, which is the deploy everything in a single AWS account. You definitely have other option to deploy it. Uh, this deployment through CloudFormation template uh, is an infrastructure as code approach. Uh, we'll create a network and the compute resource within the private subnet uh, with, uh, in different virtual private cloud to give you the network isolation and protection. Deployment will take 10 minutes. We will fast forward from here. Uh, now you can see the stack already created. We will go to AWS Elastic Compute resource. Uh, you will see there are three different compute virtual machine has been created. One for master, two for clients. Let's connect to master first. We will use AWS System Manager, Session Manager to connect the instance within the private subnet. Once we, uh, once we connect you to the, uh, the server, 
virtual machine, we can start provisioning the startup kits for uh, NVIDIA Flare. The startup kit will be created on server and will be distributed to client. So we will running NV Flare command line using a simple non-high availability mode. And then we will upload the startup kit to S3 bucket and uh, we can download from client machine to download those, those startup kit so we can provision server and client and make them connect to each other in the next step. As you can see, we use NVFlare command line for this provision, but you do have other option to use the UI uh, in the new version of uh, NVFlare, like Chris mentioned earlier. Now the startup keep have been provisioned and we will go to the client machine and download those startup key. So you can see we are connecting to client right now, also using AWS system manager, session manager. We will use AWS command line to download the startup kit from S3 bucket. We upload it from the server instance. Now the client instance also have the startup kit. We will do this same um, provisioning for the second client as well. Both client server are running on GPU instance. We use a relatively small instance, uh, which is AWS EC2 G4DN, a single GPU with a single GPU core. Uh, the server doesn't need to be, doesn't ha uh, have to be a GPU instance in this case. Now we are downloading the startup kit on the second client instance. Once the startup kit available on server and clients, now we can start server and client and register client to server to make them connect to each other. We will also use the command line those steps available in the workshop content that published. As you can see, the server now started. Next, we will start client and register them to the server. We will change the U limit uh, that setting to allow for this particular medical imaging AI ML workload. So now the first client already started and registered to the server. Next, we will start the second client using the same script. As you can see, the second client also has been started and registered. Now we can go to the server and check the status of two client. We will use NVIDIA Flare admin client to connect to the server and the check status and also submit the job. Now we're connecting to the server using system manager session manager. This is a separate terminal, but for the same server instance. We will use NVIDIA uh, Flare admin client command line tool. Start the admin client. Log in using the email uh, address. And we can run the command line to like check status of server. We can see how many clients has been registered. You can see there are two clients registered. Now it's confirmed the server and client are connecting to each other. We can prepare to submit a job. For this demo, we use Monai Flare integration. This is a new version of Monai. It's publicly available on the uh, on this GitHub and the Flare GitHub. So we will download the GitHub. 
um, all the all the uh, content, the libraries, uh, um, and data set and the step-by-step -step instruction available on the GitHub. We will follow the instruction. First, we need to download all the necessary library on the uh, server side and on the uh, client instance. We will need to download the data and also install all the libraries. So now we download the Monai bundle component on the server side. So server side configuration already set up. Now let's set up the client. First, let's go to the first client. We will use a script, a Python script to download the data. This is for 3D spleen segmentation. So the data set, uh, the nifty image already prepackaged. We just need to run the command and download the image. We will do the same thing on the second client. So both clients will have the data locally to the executor. Once the data has been successfully downloaded to the client instance, we will, uh, we will see there's a data folder, right? All the, all the image file locally on two clients. Next, we will need to install all the libraries, including Flare, Monai, and many others on both instances to let them be able to run the job. So once the data and the library have been installed on the client, we can start the admin client on the server instance and uh, check status and submit the job. Now we log in the admin client on the server instance. We first check status to make sure the client still registered to the server. The two clients actively waiting for running job. And we list all the jobs. Right now, there's no job. And we will submit the job. The job configuration, the job already pre configured. And we are uh, using through the Monai bundle we downloaded early on. You can see the job submitted. When we leave the job, you can see this job in submitted status. And later on, it transitioned to running status. Once the job started running, you will be able to see all these logs on the server side and also on the client side, right? On the client side, you can see the job starting running. First, you need to load the data set from the local storage to the executor running on the client, right? So this is the first client, second client. And once the job starting running, I fast forward it a little bit, you can see it's starting training the job. We should be able to, now we should be able to check the job status, all the metrics, statistics using TensorBoard. So we will go to client one instance and we connect client, client one instance through session manager. If we want to check the job status using TensorBoard, we want to uh, uh, check uh, those data, the metric data will be emitted to this particular job. You can see the client running this job starting with the 1160 ID. And you can see the app site config has this spleen segmentation configuration. And there's a folder called evolve. That folder have all the metrics tensor board will look for to, to be able to visualize the job status and the metrics. Now we're running the tensor board server on the client side. Uh, it leads into 8080. Since the instance running within a uh, private subnet, we will use a session manager port forwarding feature to forward that port to a local port 1990 on your local instance. Now, I, this my on my laptop, I'm going to start a web page. 
on my laptop to be able to see TensorBoard page running on the client instance. All those documentation available in that workshop, publicly available. So you can see this is the TensorBoard, uh, uh, the training status you can visualize there. So that's a quick demo to show how you can deploy Flare on AWS, how to start the server client, and how to submit the job and the check job status using TensorBoard. With that, we will close our today's presentation. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Ready. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chris, Umer, Steve, uh, for sharing your time and expertise today um, and with the uh, presentations and the demo. Uh, we do have a, a couple of minutes left. Um, if there's any questions from the audience, please place them in the questions queue uh, in the GoToWebinar toolbar, um, and we will uh, be happy to direct them and answer them. Um, and if we don't have enough time today, um, then we will answer those questions as a follow-up. Um, one question that I have uh, for uh, any of you are, is, um, are there any benchmarks uh, that are used for federated learning? Chris or Steve, do you want yeah, to Yeah, I can help take that. Um, so, so we do have a set of examples in the NVIDIA Flare GitHub that walk through comparisons of the different federated learning algorithms to central training. So if you, for example, look at the CIFAR 10 examples in the NVFlare GitHub, you'll see a comparison of uh, a centrally trained model to um, a model trained using Fed Average, Fed Prox, um, Fed Opt, some of the other federated algorithms that we publish as part of the platform. You can find that in a number of the different examples on the, the Flare GitHub. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, we don't have any more questions that are coming in. We're just about at time. Uh, so I just want to thank all of you again, Chris, Umer, Dr. Fu, for sharing your time and expertise today. Uh, and I'd like to thank everyone who joined us today for participating. If you have questions about upcoming sessions or you wish to access recordings, you can follow the link uh, you see on your screen there. Uh, it's also placed in the chat. Um, you'll see on the previous slide there are some QR codes and a link for uh, workshops, self-paced workshops uh, for uh, federated learning with NVIDIA Flare. Um, before you leave today, please take a minute to give us feedback on today's session. A short survey will pop up on the screen as we close out. Uh, we host these webinars for the research community, so any feedback you have is valuable and will help us continue to deliver content that the research community cares about. Uh, thanks again for joining today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you soon.